infrastructure is killing our people and has been. And, and when people talk about the environment and they talk about the quality of the air, they say we all breathe the air, the same air. But what they fail to take into account is the story uh, that, that Lily is sharing with you, that we are not just being exposed to toxic harm right now. We have been exposed to toxic harm generationally. Uh, from colonialism and slavery from the very beginning when we had access to the worst food, the worst living conditions, and we were put in the places where all of the environmental burdens were. So generation after generation has been exposed to toxic harm, which makes us now in the face of climate change more susceptible to disease, uh, more vulnerable in a lot of different ways. Because our physical condition, our susceptibility to disease did not manifest yesterday. It didn't manifest when we were born and we lived right next to all the burdens that were put in our community. It's really the, 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 the result of, hist of historical trauma, of what we call historical trauma. And that's the case regardless of class. If you are a person of color living in the United States, chances are that you're living next to industry, next to infrastructure, next to the most polluting sources in the entire United States. If you live in black Hollywood, you're living next to those oil rigs. If you're living in Clinton Hill, although that's changing tremendously and you can't say the neighborhood's black anymore, but if you're living there, and even if you go and you see where public housing is, you're gonna see the stacks of the power plants spewing into people's windows. So regardless of class, if you're a person of color, anywhere in the entire United States, chances are you're living next to the environmental workers. So I just wanted to add that because we discover it and then all of a sudden we're measuring NOx, SOx, carbon monoxide, and then the climate folks are saying, well, we need to focus on carbon. And that's one of the reasons they killed. We did not support cap and trade because we said cap and trade didn't address the issue of siting and it didn't address the issue of co-pollutants that were killing our people. We can't do one without the other. We have to do it Oh, I'm sorry. So, and so, and speaking of notes, actually, actually, send around a sign-in sheet. If you do want to read the notes from this session, then I can send them to you. So, um, anyway, I'll ask the next question, and then I'll work on that um, process. So, next question: How does the intersectionality framing apply to the impacts of climate change? I think, I think she just framed that so beautifully. I think she did talk about the intersection. She said, it's, I'm having a bilingual. Bueno, mi gente, a veces me pasa. So, um, yeah. Um, so it's very difficult for me to be in a, um, in a workshop like this or in a forum like this and not talk about privilege. Um, I often say, and I tweet, that privilege is the biggest obstacle to addressing climate change. And you could tweet that now, too. <laughs> Follow me, young Pierre. And, and I say that because the one thing that freaks me out, even as we're getting ready for the People's Climate March in September, is how people are handling or managing their privilege. Even when we ask them to read the Hermes Principles for Democratic Organizing, and we ask them to agree, and they agree, and, and I'm going to go through them really quickly, all right? Just going to go through it because. At the end, if we all agree, if we all agree that we're going to work together to address climate change, if we don't change the way that we work with each other, if we don't work, if we don't change that, we won't be able to do this. That's how simple that is, and and it it manifests in a lot of ways. So those principles are read quickly, are be inclusive. You would think that would be a no-brainer. Emphasize on bottom-up organizing. Um, People speak for themselves, work together for mutuality and solidarity, build just relationships, and make a commitment to self-transformation. So we have these meetings, and we discuss all these things, and we talk about the role of privilege, and then, of course, the same person picks up the, the hand and sucks out all the oxygen out of the room without thinking that maybe they are doing that too much, and that there are some people who have different levels of education, who come to the table with different experiences and not giving them the space to communicate. One of the things that we've learned as we are started doing the work around community uh, climate adaptation and resilience at our organization is that it isn't always the people with the highest level of education or with the most uh, educational resources that have the answers. That people like us who come from struggle have always had to live sustainably because there's nothing, because poor people know how to repurpose, reuse, and recycle. 
uh, because people who come from struggle have had to live within their carbon footprint and have had to do the most with the least, right? So there are stories, there are experiences that come from being who we are, from wherever we come from, that can really redefine what being an American is. Because to people who are coming from other countries, being an American means to be wasteful. It means being addicted to consumption culture. And it means that if you're going to be successful, then you should be wasteful too. You should have a million pairs of shoes because that's what it means to be successful in this country, right? And to tell people who've never had anything before that they can't is the epitome of arrogance. They want it, it narcotizes them, it makes them feel good because struggle is something that unless you've experienced it on an everyday level, you don't understand. So we can't judge it. So finding the ways that we work together, I'm sorry. Well, somebody just tweeted. All right. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, so even before, and, and I know, you know, uh, Lily's been doing this for, for a real long time. We all know each other. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about when I came here today was um, how uh, people want to pick leaders in our community. Uh, and how annoying I find that and distressing that they have to pick leaders. And, and it reminds me, if, if you can indulge me for a second, of the this, this story when I was in law school, um, this uh, professor told me that the con law professor was freaking out. He was freaking out because there was no diversity in his classroom. There were, there were no people of color. And so my African-American professor says, yeah, there is. There's one. And he was like, oh. one was enough. And so we go to meetings where one is enough because one can be managed. So people want to anoint us to be the person who speaks for everyone. They seduce us. They come to us. And there's always going to be the weak link in the movement, that person who, you know, nobody ever made them feel that good before, right? And so, but that, they are comfortable with being in a meeting where there are 18 white folks and one or two people of color, and that's okay. And if there's two, that becomes a problem. I know because I come from meetings where there are two of us. And so, um, and I was telling Jackie when I came in that I feel so elbowed that my ribs are hurting. It's like, muevete. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. So, um, so if you walk into a space and it doesn't look like a neighborhood in New York City and you're making all the decisions, you're in the wrong room, you're defining the space improperly and you need to check your privilege. So I, I, I have to say that because even people with good intentions are having such a difficult time uh, I have a few of the, oh, that privilege is the biggest obstacle to uh, addressing climate change. It's true. Yeah, yeah so, so I have another one, but uh, I'm sure. not, but I, I want Libby, I want Libby to talk. <laughs> um, so, I, as I mentioned, you know, I, if you would have talked to me about environmentalism when I was younger, I would have laughed in your face. You know, I have... I don't know any polar bears, whales are cool, but like the people in my neighborhood, um, specifically the young people, that was my main priority. Um, but then once I saw the environmental justice framework, it all made sense. And I, I encourage you all to check out the environmental justice principles. They're part of the, um, the founding principles that serve as a moral compass for our movement. Um, and I want to give you all just one quick story. Um, on Friday, my friend Mark Lopez called me from East LA. And they're working on a big, huge portfolio of environmental justice issues there in the City of Commerce. And they had a offer from this company to put one of their co-directors on um, a decision-making board with the possibility of getting some funds. And so he called me because he said, I know that you all in your community were fighting um, Edison International. They had two of the oldest coal-fired power plants in our community. Um, and he's like, and I want to make sure that there's nobody actively working against this company before we go ahead and pursue this. And that to me was like why I love the environmental justice movement. Um, we really pride ourselves on making sure that whatever victory we're aiming for in our community is not going to become a burden on another community. We're, 
adamantly opposed to shifting burden. Um, and it keeps us together. You know, it keeps our movement, regardless if we are the least funded movement. And as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, um, they, they try to silo us and try to silo individuals and try to make it about a brown or black unicorn in the room. And that, I'm very uncomfortable being the only person of color in a, in a space. When I moved, I moved from Chicago to DC um, in 2009 to take on the environmental justice director position at Energy Action Coalition. And I, I was like, you know what, this is gonna be okay. I've, I have a couple of white friends, I, you know, I know white people, it's not gonna be that bad. I get there and it was like the biggest culture shock of my life. Because these weren't like the white folks that I was used to that were from working class families that went to the same Chicago public schools as I did. These were kids that were sons and daughters of oil executives working around climate change, which is awesome, yes. You know, you've got access to some of the most powerful people. But don't do it to rebel against your parents. You know, use that access to power um, to really move our movement forward. Um, sons and daughters of like former senators. And these kids would talk about their summer vacations and all this stuff, and I was like completely disconnected from that, you know? Um, if it weren't for my community supporting me, you know, I would call home like in tears because I felt inadequate. I felt like I didn't go to the schools that these kids went to. Like, I went to junior college and then I went to a commuter school and my background is in bilingual bicultural education. Um, and I, that was the first time that I had to work with people of such privilege. But I knew, as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, their intentions were good and they would treat me to lunch and sometimes after work we'd go to happy hour and they'd pay for my wine and whatever I would drink. But when it came to decision making power, that was non-negotiable. And um, I got into a lot of um, heated debates with them in spaces um, and I refused you know, to be the only person of color in the space. And any moment that I was able to bring more people into the room, I did. Um, but they, it's a threatening, it's a threatening act, you know. Um, and we should not settle for just that one person of color um, in the room. Because we don't ever settle for just one white man in leadership, right? We don't ever just settle for one white person and say, well, check, box is checked. We did it, our commitment to diversity. Um, but I'm going kind of off the topic, but going back to the intersectionality frame um, and how it applies to the impacts of climate change. Um, there's this great docu-series um, called Living in Dangerous Times on Showtime. The Years of Living Dangerous Times. Thank you. That's a different one. Thank you. And I watched the first episode and there's a reporter from the New York Times that has been focusing on the conflicts in the Middle East. And so his, his latest work has been around the conflicts in Syria. He went out to Syria and he interviewed people and he realized that in the four years leading to um, the social unrest in Syria, that there was a huge drought that caused people from the countryside, farmers, um, to move to the big cities. And that resulted in 10 people living in a room maybe smaller than this, substandard living conditions, right? And so that coupled with just the lack of government accountability and the lack of resources that people were getting, um, turned into what we see now as <coughs> conflict in Syria. And that's not the only case. Remember Darfur years ago? That is a conflict that also started because two um, tribal groups shared a watering hole for the herds that they worked with. That started to dry up and obviously conflict arose. So the intersectionalities of, of the impacts of climate change are really deep. I see it in my community. The first warm days in Chicago, you see an upsurge in gang violence. So the longer, and I love summertime, especially in Chicago, so much fun stuff to do. 
but I started to see the links between the longer summers, um, the bigger heat waves, and what that causes. Um, so there are many different things, you know, from the extraction of these um, fossil, dangerous fossil fuels and extreme energy in communities, indigenous communities that have been fighting for sovereignty, you know, for the last 500 years, fighting against imperialism, um, fighting to get more resources in their communities, um, having to face drought, having to face shortages of water. Um, so there's many different ways that all of these issues come to head. And I think that Hurricane Katrina is one of the most vivid examples that we have in recent history, um, where you have people that were already economically oppressed um, having to evacuate their homes. And we see how white supremacy played a role in who was able to escape, right? Who had the resources to actually get into a vehicle and leave. And I don't know if you all saw that image of black folks trying to cross a bridge and there was sheriffs um, at the bridge preventing people. And so when we talk about climate justice, like we're talking about an overall ending to violence against our communities, wars against our communities. Um, because all of these systemic, like all of these historical systemic issues that our communities face only get exacerbated by climate change. And you can also see that in how Hurricane Sandy um, affected people here as well. Yeah, there, there is a... It's, it's, it's one of the things is that our frame comes out of the environmental justice movement, and so when we think about uh, inter, inter, I can't say that word, but um, mm -hmm. we think about where we work, play, live, learn. Uh, environment for us is everything. And, and one of the things that we're seeing happening now, which is really, really sad, um, is that our environmental successes are being used by developers to promote the displacement of our community. So the minute that we get a, a, a greenway or we get a waterfront park, developers are using our successes. Um, the successes that we've gotten, by the way, through being underfunded, working extremely hard, because if an institution is headed by a person of color, chances are you're going to get fund less funding than if it's a white executive director. And that's, that, there are studies on that. I'm not making that up. Um, and um, because people like missionaries, and they like, and, and they, they like green missionaries. And our community sometimes, in the effort to try to green things up, doesn't really think about the political frame. You know, people start urban gardens where the people who run the institutions and make the decisions are people who moved into those communities because the, ch the rent was cheap, but the kids picking the plants are black children. And, and though that kind of power dynamic is unacceptable to us. Um, and I think that if you raise it with the folks that are doing this, they're like, wait, you know, but this wasn't here. We're bringing something. But what you're not doing is shifting power. Our organization is intergenerational. What that means is that young people are on our board of directors. They're on our staff. They're an integral part of decision making. We don't have a youth program where we sit around and say, ooh, what do the young people think? We believe that leadership is a continuum and that you exercise leadership throughout that continuum and that people come with different levels of training and so you level the playing field by providing that but that young young people don't have to wait to exercise leadership they just need to be provided with the tools just like our community but the idea of creating this youth program minoritizes them puts them in a silo and they are not an integral part it's it, it, it's 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 patronizing right well same thing with race the same thing with race when you basically have people coming into our communities because they have this dream and this vision and they've been wanting to do this and our communities are so cool and so raw and they basically set up shop and do things that we have been doing for a minute without exploring who's doing what, how do we work so that we work to complement what they're doing and support it instead of sort of parachuting in and telling us what's in the best interest of our community. And so you see places like like, like uh, New Orleans, where now there's massive gentrification, and there are tensions between new immigrants and black people. Um, and I'm going to use black people because I never thought there was anything wrong with black. And coming from African ancestry, both of us, we did that, we did that. Um, 
So, so, and then you've got, you know, folks that are coming in, um, smart, coming in, taking these jobs that are low wages and then organizing so that they can get better wages. But pitting themselves against the people who've been there for a minute, creating tensions where people really should be working together. In New York City, you're seeing, you know, you see the unions, right? And you see the unions, they don't want to say things like extraction, coal, divestment, fracking. They don't want to say those things. But our people need to work somewhere. And so we need to figure out how we build those bridges and how we engage in a conversation that introduces our people to the next economy, to figuring out how we're going to live with what we need instead of what we want. Um, and how do you do that with people who have been struggling for so long and never had anything? It is really complicated. But how we do it together, I think, really, really matters. So for me, I'm going to try again with the intersectionality. <laughs> Yay. Yay, got it, I got it out. Um, all of it is connected. All of it is connected. What we tell, for example, the large groups that uh, get all the funding, I mean, you got to check that out. Uh, you know, the Environmental Defense, NRDC, all of them, they get all the bucks, right? We uh, understand that they have uh, access to resources and technical expertise that is absolutely necessary for our community. And in every one of those organizations, there's always that one person or two people who went there because they want to do good. And when they work with us in a way that is principled and respectful, we're able to do some really powerful transformational things. Uh, Lillian said something that really I wanted to tweet her, but I couldn't find her handle. Mm -hmm. She said, um, we are adamantly opposed to shifting the burden. What that means is that as a movement, we share resources, we share expertise, we take each other's backs. If something is happening, if there's a, a facility coming to Sunset Park, and we say, no, you can't put it in Sunset Park, we're not going to say, yeah, you can put it in Hunts Point. You can't put it in Newark. You can't put it in Jersey City. Um, so we support each other in that way. And, uh, and, and it, that, I think, it extends to all of the other isms that our communities are dealing with. Our young people come to our organization while they have been racially profiled and stopped by the police on the way to come and do some community work. So we can't separate those things and we don't. And, um, but, but how we approach them and how you take your good spirit, your will, your intentions and transform it into something that is going to create a different kind of rhythm so that we can approach climate change together, I, I think that's the, that's the challenge. So in some ways, I think both of you have addressed this next question about um, how the personal and political adage applies to you, but if you'd like to elaborate on it, otherwise, I feel like you've covered that. Yeah, I, it, is, it is really difficult when you come from struggle not to think that this isn't personal. Um, we live, we're born, raised, and grow up in these communities. We work in these communities. We were, for some of us who are a little bit older, the children of the Civil Rights Movement who had the opportunity to go to school and came back with our degrees. Somebody said to me the other day, oh, you're a lawyer. I said, I'm a lawyer and I'm street. It's a bad combination, you know. Uh, I know, you know, I'm one generation away from poverty. I know my father spent his life in and out of prison and he was a junkie. That's where I come from. I come from struggle. And so my law degree was really an opportunity. And what I learned when I was a kid was that over 50% of the Congress had a law degree and less than 1% of my community had one. And that everything we did, whether it's air, how this pocketbook was made, or this orange, was regulated. It was sort of thinking about power is how I went into it. Went into law school, hated it, hated lawyers, had no rhythm for them. But it has been, a it was a tremendous opportunity to take what I learned, break it down, and make it accessible to people on the ground. That, that has been the joy of being a lawyer for me. Um, but it is personal. It is personal when all of my family who uh, stayed in the South Bronx when it was burning, developed lupus, upper respiratory disease, and asthma. Uh, it is personal when you have health problems, lots of them when you eat well, when you're healthy, when you've never done anything to compromise your system. Uh, it is all personal when you see that you have people on the board of directors who get up in the middle of the night to see if their children are still breathing. Um, so it is not some intellectual exercise that we went to school to study so that we can then help people that, that can't help themselves. Um, it, is, it is all personal. 
And now with climate change and with Sandy, 2007, 2008, Uprose was testifying. One of our young people who just came back from Antarctica from the South Pole, uh, who got the Brower Award representing North America, testified in front of EPA that there was a 90% chance of a storm surge in New York City. And no one was listening. And we knew that our communities would be hardest hit. And so, um, so we are working with scientists, with engineers, with planners, with GIS, with, with you know, mappers, with all kinds of people. It is really different. It is not the 70s anymore. We have access to those kinds of resources in our communities. And so working with us doesn't have to be a challenge. It could be a real party. It could be an, uh, an emotional, intellectual, spiritual, lifting opportunity of transformation. Um, but it is indeed personal. Yes, it is very personal. As I mentioned, you know, for me, it was finding the links between mercury and lead and some of the violent outbreaks in my community. I came across data showing that um, about 50% of the prison inmates in Texas had elevated levels of lead. And that was just one study. There's been numerous studies linking that. And um, knowing that, you know, not only are the schools um, in my community under-resourced, knowing that the libraries in my community, you know, have um, outdated books, um, knowing that, like, all of the resources that would help my community members um, improve their lives and the lives of their families um, have always been scarce. Um, and then also realizing that my community was targeted by environmental racism. You know, realizing that it wasn't just my community that was targeted by environmental racism that there are black communities across the country, that there are indigenous communities across this country that have been targeted. And when I say targeted, I mean targeted. It's not, oops, we put a like plant here. We didn't know what the demographic makeup was. No, it was intentional. They put it there because of that, because of the sole reason that they think we don't have the power. Um, and it's, it's also personal. Um, for me to think about the reasons why some of my family members migrate to this country. A lot of the folks that are migrating come from um, the fields. You know, they're the ones that are growing the food, the food for us. And they are exposed, you know, to pesticides. Um, but they're also forced to leave their lands to come up north because of droughts um, or because of of things like NAFTA, you know, where we, um, the U.S. has set parameters on how much people can produce in Mexico and, um, and now with CAFTA in Central America. Um, and so it's, it's personal on so, so many levels. Um, and I think I'm going to tie this back to the previous question. One of the biggest challenges um, that I faced in working with my um, white colleagues was that they look at everything myopically. And everything is about just climate change. And we don't have that luxury coming from our community. We have to see things through a kaleidoscope. We have to see how all of these things relate. And supporting immigration rights is also part of the climate challenge. Supporting um, to like end the prison, the school to prison pipeline is also directly linked to environmental justice and climate justice. You know, there's so many linkages, and we see that because we live those lives every single day. Um, so the personal is political because, as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, for us we come from these lives. It's not something we've read in a sociology textbook. It's what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Are you interested in sharing your Twitter handle? Oh, oh sure. No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's um, EJ Chola, C H E J C H O L A 1. Okay. 
It's a nickname that I have. <laughs> and for those who don't already have Elizabeth, I know some of you already found it, but um, do you want to share yours a little bit? Yam Pierre. Y E A M P I E R R E. I'm not on Twitter much. I need to anymore. <laughs> I, I got the mayor's office really pissed once, uh, twittering, and I got them to change something really important. They were, it was after Sandy, and they held a meeting to discuss the impacts of Sandy in the most privileged community and excluded Sunset Park and Red Hook, and I was twittering, and they went nuts. And, I, and at that moment, I realized that it was a really good organizing tool, and, and, that's, and then, uh, that's why I started using it. Um, so yeah, and they, they ended up coming to Sunset Park. Okay, so, so, and again, we've already talked about some of these already, but if you have anything to add, uh, what barriers must be overcome in order for the movement to advance climate justice to succeed? I think, you know, I, I think Lily just beautifully framed it um, when she was talking about uh, how things are intersected um, and how our movements need to be working with each other. Um, I think there's a lot of navel-gazing, a lot of talking about things and not a lot of doing. Um, you know, I think that uh, people are very tunnel vision and that uh, their issue is the only issue. And, and, and that's fine, um, but I, you know, I, I've been in meetings where we've been trying to figure out how do we roll out this People's Climate March? How do we uh, have this big, big net which brings everybody in and everybody struggle? And, um, and we hear people saying, well, we need to talk about fracking, and fracking, and fracking, and fracking. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, we got you. <laughs> fracking is going to be there. There's no stopping it. It's important. And, and I'll say, well, you know, we want to make sure that as people are coming from all over the country and all over the world, that the local narrative doesn't disappear, that the struggle of people in Red Hook, in Lower East Side, Sunset Park, in Barrio, uh, the South Bronx, that, that, doesn't, that, that there's a way that we could bring up the struggle of our people because when they leave we will still be here and we want to make sure that there's a community building process that takes place between now and this and the march so that it isn't just the march the march is just the one day but what we want to do is build climate consciousness from now until the march and we want to use different kinds of ways of community building we can take advantage of a lot of the stuff that's happening in the summer in New York City, but we need to, you know, we need to do that. And it may be different for each community, you have to respect that, and it's like fracking, fracking. And we're like, you know, when you do that, it turns us off. It turns us off and then we're like, we got no rhythm for fracking, we don't even want to talk about, it. like, what? You don't want to talk about fracking? And of course we do, and of course we support it. But it is in New York State a well-resourced, celebrity supported campaign. Whereas our campaigns, if we have to deal with one, or people have the privilege of working on one issue, we have to work on energy, on brownfields, on solid waste, on, on air quality, on lead. Our organization, the quality of life and the public health disparities in our community. We don't have the luxury to just work on the one issue. So if we say something like we support it, we're in solidarity with you, it's all good. Let it go. And it's that issue of privilege where people can't let it go. That sense of entitlement where it's about me 24-7, I have the most important thing, and I am not going to respect the fact that you just said, I got you, I got your back, and you got 50 issues to work on. That privilege is so freaking divisive. And I'm sorry to pick on the frackers, they're not the only ones. <laughs> uh, they're not the only ones. Um, so, it, it, but I use it as an example of how people can really turn people off to their, to their issue and can, and can divide when we really need to figure out how we allocate resources differently and work with each other differently um, and use this opportunity, at least because I'm going to keep saying the People's Climate March a bunch of times, uh, to do community building from now until then. And I, and, and, uh, I, I just want to throw some ideas out there of things that you can do because uh, I'm all about putting things on the ground and, and not just talking about them. Um, you could create people's tents, people's climate tents in every neighborhood. You could create art, puppetry, where people come in telling the story of their community. Um, so that, for example, if Hunts Point comes in, 
you know they have the highest asthma rate in the world. It could be a giant asthma pump. Right? Some people said things like the scientists would be coming in wearing lab coats, the beekeepers would be wearing bee suits. It, could, it has to be highly visible, really powerful, so that the world is paying attention and so that we say, this is the people's response. I mean, the thing about this march that's different is that um, we want to say, that's what we called it, the People's Climate March. We're even telling celebrities and people who think that they're dignitaries that they have to march with the people. They can't march in the front, they gotta be with the people. We've asked that the front line be made up of young people, even though we're intergenerational, we've asked that they be made up of the front because that's the generation that's gonna be most impacted by this. And we want them in the front. And, uh, and they've said yes. So, um, I feel a really strong sense of urgency. I'm really freaking out. My family lives in Miami, uh, I'm Puerto Rican. Uh, I don't think of polar bears, I think of coral reefs. Um, I, um, I'm an island person. Um, I love the city. I meet with scientists from all over the country. I sit on a lot of advisory councils. And I can tell you that people from all walks of life are freaking out about what's coming. And that there's no chance, there's just no time for us um, to sort of let our egos get in the way of working with each other differently. There's just no time. Time is up. T time is up. And so, um, yeah. I mean, that, that's all. That's all I have to say. I don't want to. I don't want to end on a on a, on a negative note. Uh, I think that this. Um, so I'm going to say this. I think this present. This is a test for our ability to do that. This is a challenge for our ability to create a different kind of community with each other. Elizabeth, you just started rattling off a list of issues, other than fracking. I'm just at some point. Right? Okay, because I realized I'm going to go so long. No, um, brownfields. Um, oh, I said support. brownfields, open space, uh, energy, um, lead, um, just a lot of different issues that we work on. It's a lot. Um, Co pollutants, SOX, SOX, carbon monoxide. We've got state of the art technology where we measure PM 2.5 and all of those emissions in Sunset Park. Uh, transportation. We do a lot of work around transportation justice. Uh, the lack of access to mass uh, transit uh, in communities that, you know, people don't go into the, the, the CBD anymore. They go from Brooklyn to Queens and back. And there are communities like Canarsie that don't have access to buses. We know that climate change is going to change transportation because the subway is no longer going to be an option. So uh, mass transit is a big issue for, for our organization. And we've been involved in local, citywide, statewide, and national campaigns. And it's a little organization. And we wonder how we do all that, you know, but we do. And, and it's stressful and it affects our health because we work 24 seven. So, um, so anyway, I, I, it's a lot of issues and if you go to the website, you'll see some of them. It's okay. Um, so some of the barriers I already talked about, just the myopic view of the mainstream environmental movement. And this is not something new. This is something that is historical. There's been historical tensions between environmentalist people of color and indigenous people. Um, and that's another, th I'll leave that for later. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, the environmental movement was started by mainly white males. And there's a lot of scholars that studied, you know, why was it white males? Well, women were involved in women's suffrage at the time. You know, there was other issues that white women were facing. And so white men wanted to preserve their hunting lands. It started more about preserving and conserving um, these natural spaces. Um, and that this was like in the late 1800s um, when the Sierra Club um, started. And um, there was a time period where the Sierra Club would not allow people of color, specifically black people, to join even as paying members. So the racism is one of the biggest barriers, I think, in, in this. Um, because unfortunately, our movements, as much as we try to create a new paradigm, we don't focus on the self-transformation piece enough. And it's like, you know, our one of the godfathers of, of the left, you know, Paolo Freddi, he says in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, like, if we're serious about shifting the paradigm, oppressed people 
have to um, formulate their own ideologies because what winds up happening is we wound up adopting the ideologies of our oppressor. Um, and so we're, we all suffer from oppression. We all suffer from white supremacy, even if you have been on the beneficiary side of it. There's some deep mental health issues that come along with living in a white supremacist society um, for all members involved. And so, you know, we tried to work um, with the environmental movement and um, in the past, and we were often left at the altar because when it came to focusing on issues such as the lead abatement in inner city housing, the environmentalists were like, what does that have to do with the environment? You know, and it's like, this is what our communities, again, going back to that intersectional um, lifestyle that we live, and that's what, they're focus that's what they're facing, you know? I often talk about how the Koch brothers, they don't focus on one single issue. These mugs are thinking of <laughs> kaleidoscope, right? All type issues. They're like, how are we going to? Sorry, I had to get a little bit. I try not to be. That's always um, good. That's okay. <laughs> but you know, like, they're talking about immigration. They're talking about gun control. They're talking about, um, you know, completely taking civil rights out um, and Chicano studies out of history. Um, they're not just focusing on the environment. You know, they're they're trying to roll back EPA right um, EPA regulations and power, and they're trying to like advance their agenda, but they're seeing it from a 360 degree view, and I think that that's one of the most crippling things for the progressive movement or left movement as a whole, is that we, tr we focus on just one issue, and that it has to do, I think, with the resources and how foundations kind of put you in that, um, in a box. Um, as I, as I mentioned, you know, um, racism and classism are also some of the huge burdens, and I, I really encourage, you know, white people to do that transformative work. Um, look for um, support networks. There are, you know, like there's um, in training institutions that focus on anti-racism and anti-oppression, and I think that that's really important. Um, work to do as we work to decolonize our minds because as I mentioned earlier, you know, people of color and indigenous folks, we don't all get along. Um, and that's hard for me and that's something I've started to share a little bit more openly um, because I was taught you leave the dirty laundry in the house, you don't ever share the family affairs. But I think as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, we have to work together in ways that we've never worked in before and that involves honesty and transparency. Um, I also um, wanted to talk about the movement ADD syndrome that we have. You know, it's like whatever the new hot thing is, that's what all of the environmental movement is going to focus on. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, fracking is a big thing now. Fracking's been a big issue in Indian country. And our folks um, in North Dakota have been fighting against fracking and the industry for at least a decade. When um, we were fighting to shutter the coal plants in Chicago, the Sierra Club approached us in 2007 to partner with us and they asked us what our campaign goal was and we said we want to completely shut these coal plants down. And they said, why don't you ask to transition to natural gas? That's more politically realistic. And we said, F. Off. Why? Because we know people that are in North Dakota fighting against fracking. We knew because our network, we live at the source of these issues. Um, and so that's another suggestion, another barrier is the Columbus Syndrome, you know, where people think that they've discovered the new issue. If you would be listening to the canaries in the mine, we wouldn't have to wait till James Hansen comes out with, you know, the tar sands if the PXL pipeline gets built, then, you know, it's game over for the climate. What about the indigenous people that have been living at ground zero for the past 20 years of the tar sands extraction? You know, like, they've been there, but no one wanted to listen because it's, 
it's too much. It's like, wait, wait. We have to fight against imperialism, and we have to fight to, like, um, I don't want to say protect the sovereignty, because indigenous and first nations people don't even have the sovereignty, but to uphold these treaties. You know, like, I've had so many of my colleagues be like, that's unrealistic, that's just way too much. It's like, if we're really going to get to the root of these issues, we have to roll up our sleeves. And this is for the long haul, you know, this is, we're training for a marathon, and that's what, in our communities, in the EJ and CJ movement, we know this. We've been working, we can't just jump from one issue to the other. We don't have, again, that's a luxury. We can't say, okay, you know what, fracking is a new thing, I'm gonna forget about all these other issues in my community. No, they're still there. And do you think we wanna be working on a campaign for a decade? No, we don't want to be working on a campaign for a decade. We often have people come in, they're like, well, have you tried this avenue and this? Yes, we have tried that all. But because of institutional racism and classism, there are barriers for us being able to get to those victories. Um, and so with the Keys Keystone Excel pipeline, you know, Bill McKibben, I think he's like one of the quintessential Columbus Syndrome sufferers in my mind because, and he does discovered environmental justice. You know, like, it's like open up your mind when, don't think that because this is the first time you're hearing about something that it's a new thing. Um, yes. Uh, no, no, but, I, but I, I, I do want to say something that's really, ahead. really, and I don't want to forget it. So here's how everything is changing. By 2042, we're the majority in the country. And so we are not fighting to be at anybody's table anymore. We're just building our own. And you could come to ours if you come correct, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying that. Just two weeks ago, a UBIC woman told me that they were only able to hunt, hunt 300 walruses, where in the past, they were able to hunt 1,000 and that her village was going hungry in Alaska. So these are the people that, that Lily is talking about. These are part of our community. This is our community across the, across the country. So the majority of the country is gonna look like us. And it's gonna look like us at a time when climate change has basically having its way with us and the economy is going to be tanking. And if our communities on a grassroots level are not engaged in a way that's meaningful to lead this charge, we are in so much trouble. So it is so important that the power dynamics change because our communities need to feel as strongly about climate change as they did about the civil rights movement back in the day. And as long as they think other people are taking care of them and that they're, t they're managing it and that they're the passive recipients of somebody, think about what happens to our communities. The organizations that exist in our communities that are really well funded are usually social service organizations. So our communities come in like lemmings to get their problems solved for them. Our organizations are not, it's not a social service, it's a social justice organization. It's about creating community power, about people driving their own agenda, about people setting their own goals, and leadership looking like them so that they can see themselves in these positions. That, given what we know about climate change, and given what we know about the change in the population, is so freaking important. I can't even begin to tell you. Do you want to lead a group of people and then have those people depend on you because that's what your ego needs? Or do you want to facilitate the building of meaningful community engagement that really transforms the life landscape and transforms power relationships? That's, that's what I think we need, we need to do because it's here. It's having its way with us. You know, the West Coast is burning. Gasland, we saw Gasland. We were trying to be supportive. They bought it to Uprose. And you know what I saw? I saw a film that was made in Indian country in the Southwest, and I didn't see one Mexican. I didn't see one indigenous person. And the people in the audience looked at it and said, what? It was a missed opportunity to build relationships, to create solidarity, to tell the whole story. It was a missed opportunity, and we don't have any time to miss anymore. Yeah, sorry. I get upset. I'm sorry. It's just that I just think that some of this is just common sense. You know, let, let, let's do this together and let's do it right, you know? So I do want to open, because I think with yeah, our last yeah. question, we were talking about principles, and both of you referred to the EJ principle and the MS principle. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can just open it up to the group in terms of a discussion, questions, or comments. 
like to bring to the panel. Sort of one thing that uh, I noticed in like what you all were talking about with issues in their communities is in some ways it parallels a lot of the issues in like that poor white people face in like rural Appalachia with hydrofracking and mountaintop removal in that it is like the like literal destruction of your like land and your community and also the literal destruction of your bodies via like pollution. And I was wondering, I know rural Appalachia, I know from personal experience rural Appalachia is not always the nicest place in terms of racial justice. But I was wondering if there's any sort of history of trying to like bridge the similarities in those two issues and like work together and like if it's working now, if it didn't work out, or like what needs to be done on that front. Because I think that could be like a powerful alliance. So, so we do work with folks from uh, Appalachia and we've even, I, I served as uh, the, the chair of the, the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council and I recommended that someone from there be appointed because I thought that was important. My experience has been, though, um, at good and bad. Uh, definitely there are a lot of things in common. Uh, but then when race comes into question, the people from Appalachia become the fracking people in the room. Mm -hmm. So we can have uh, a, a gathering of folks, and we are listening to everyone. We're listening you know, to the folks from Indian country, We're listening to folks from the West Coast, everybody. But then the people from that part of the world just take up all of the oxygen. You know, and they become fracking people, and so they discard. So it becomes a very uncomfortable thing because the privilege is just out of control. But do we think that it is a tremendously important uh, issue? And do we see the connections between mountaintop removal and our struggle? Absolutely. I mean, we shared with our young people just pictures, just pictures of mountains that had had been destroyed because it's just on a on a visceral level so painful to see, even if you don't know the human story, just to see what they've done to the mountain. Uh, we totally connect with that, with that struggle. I um, did not know that poor white people existed, <laughs> honestly, um, until I was older. Because um, I, I mean, there was always the like little jokes about hillbillies and like poor white trash, but the white people that I, interface with were either really wealthy or working class. Um, so like poor, poor white people, I didn't know about till I was older. Um, and I actually met some of the folks um, like Judy Bonds and Larry, Larry Gibson, Gibson yes, um, in, at the 2007 US Social Forum. And that was really transformative for myself and for the delegation that I was there with from the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization because we obviously automatically saw the connection. Here they are dealing with the source of coal and here we are dealing with the um, combustion, right? Like from the cradle to the grave. And so from that experience we actually did form an alliance um, and we, we did these um, kind of cultural exchanges that we called from the holler to the hood and um, we brought in folks um, from the hollers, which are like the valleys, um, to our hood. And they talked at the local high schools, and they, you know, we took them around to get a toxic tour. And then we also went down, and I did uh, a flyover of one of the MTR sites, and that was devastating. Um, and for me, like, I did not, um, personally face any sort of racial discrimination when I was in Appalachia, but I think it's because I, at times I can be white passing, as hard as that is for me to admit. I'm safe. I'm a safer looking person of color, right? Um, I completely identify as a person of color, but if I think I would have been there with like one of my black homies, it would have been a completely different experience. Um, and so to answer your question, we have been successful in forming alliances and at least sharing, you know, the common narrative. Um, but as Elizabeth mentioned, the, the issue of race does come up. Um, and I, I still have great memories of going to Appalachia. And the young people from my community, when they met Judy Bonds, they were like, she's hood, she's hood just like yeah. us, oh my god, we can really connect. Because they had never been able to connect with white people. Um, and so that was transformative for them, and I mean, that's worth a billion dollars in my mindset. I was a youth worker in Chicago. 
Uh, this is really inspiring and great. I'm, I'm doing my PhD in sociology and I'm studying social class and climate change and how they intersect. So your statement about privilege um, is just really powerful because for me, I always thought it was status. The privilege brings that other kind of punch to it. I think I wanted, um, uh, I don't know how I want to make a corrective here or, um, so I like everything you said about when you said London music. Class aside, if you look at you know, environmental justice, and so since I study class, I'm like, well, oh, you can't just take class. In. But I don't, I don't I'm think... I'm to take it out. I just right. said that if you just but look at face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me finish. Um, but I think one of the things I also study is, too, is how class often gets misrecognized. And we say race, 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 race. Or like white people, oh, I, you know. And, and so I think a lot of times what we're really saying is sort of like middle class white people. Um, so I think we just want to be careful with the intersectionality is definitely there but how class is still, I think, a more prevalent issue with environmental issues. And, I mean, they're, they're, they're interesting. That's all. They, they are, but we've had um, sociologists, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Robert Bullard, um, yes. and you know they commissioned a study um, called Toxic Waste and Rates. Um, toxic what? Toxic Waste and Rates. And they looked at income levels of black folks and um, the proximity for them living near a waste site. And race superseded class. Um, so even when you do have middle income black people, um, if, according to this study, they're still subjected to living within one to three miles of a toxic hazardous site. Um, one statistic, to, yeah, one statistic to just to, uh, 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 toxic waste and race. But, but you should just um, look at Bob Bullard's books. Yeah. He has a little long. <laughs> yeah. But the one uh, statistic that stands out that really emphasizes that point is that an African American family making $50,000 a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white family making $15,000 a year. So that was really, that's the one that often gets used to really emphasize that point. And I think also one thing is that, and I feel safe-ish in this space, and I'm going to share this with you all. Um, I think we really, in the United States, have to look at our anti-blackness. Not just here in the US, but across the globe, right? Um, because we can play a Prussian Olympics, you know, and I could say, well, I migrated here with my family. I had to learn English. You know, um, my mom worked. She's a domestic laborer. Like, I didn't go to a great college. But if Jackie and I walk into a room together, automatically I have more privilege. Maybe when we start talking credentials, that might be a little bit different. But race is a serious issue in this country, um, still to this day. And the New York Times actually had a great article recently about Latinos. And this is something that I've been talking about since the 2010 census, that they don't have, you know, because Latinos are not considered a race, right? So they don't have a little checkbox for us in that area. So then we have, we're faced with white, negro, negro, that was the actual term used in the 2010 um, census, indigenous, Asian, Pacific, Islander, um, and because of our colonized minds in Latin America, unfortunately. Like my mom talks about what she learned in Honduras was that the Spaniards came over and saved the indigenous people, that they were savages. Like this is the history that, there, that she was taught, right? Um, people are not going to check the indigenous box, unfortunately, right away. They're sure as hell are not gonna check the negro box. And so that puts us in the position to check white. And thinking about how the history of the Latin diaspora and what role you know um, Europeans played in that, um, it's going to be very easy for Latinos to assimilate within a couple of generations for some of us that don't have like um, a lot of African ancestry recently. 
you know? But there are some that are white. There are some yes. Latinos that are white. I mean, exactly. you know, my, my mom came here um, and she was here during the Black Power Movement. And basically what she said to me is that you may be light-skinned, but our ancestors came through the Mid-Atlantic Passage, some ended up in the Caribbean, and some ended up in Brazil, and some ended up in, in the United States, and we're all part of the same people. And the reason I say that, and that's why I introduced myself as someone of African and indigenous ancestry, I don't just say Puerto Rican, because honestly, you talk about the Argentinians, you talk about people from Spain, Hispanic or Latino is considered anybody with a Spanish surname, anybody who comes from Spain, and Spaniards certainly don't think that they're people of color. Um, and so, People think we're homogenous, and they, they lump us yeah. all in together when we're all so different from each other. Um, my son, uh, when he was in sixth grade, he graduated from college two years ago, he didn't speak Spanish. I was trying to get him to learn how to speak Spanish because it was practical. And now that he's seriously dating, he wants to learn how to speak Spanish. But, <laughs> but, back, but back when he was in sixth grade, he said, Mom, Spanish is just the language of another slaver, another colonizer. You want me to speak both? What does a mom say to that? I raise them on the left side of the room, <laughs> the right thing. So, so I share that with you, and I'm sorry I interrupted. It's just that it's so complicated with it us. Is very because you say Latino, and then just anybody is Latino. You watch the novelas on TV, and basically they're these really uber white women um, with maids that look like our moms. You know what I mean? So, so and, and look, look, what have we learned, right? We have learned how to treat each other. Um, how the corporations that we criticize um, treat us, right? So that whole power dynamic of being competitive, um, taking each other out, that kind of like the, the self-hate, we internalize all that stuff. So you're, you're absolutely right. I, this is an issue that we talk a lot when we do our leadership training. We, talk, we ask everybody who their people are. Who your people are matters. And then we connect all of those struggles. So if we have somebody from Egypt, we want to know if you're from Palestine, we want to know. If you're from Mexico, we want to know. And then we connect those struggles because when somebody says to me, I'm Latina, well, that doesn't, no, I'm very specific. I'm a Puerto Rican of, of indigenous African ancestry. Because saying I'm Latina is like saying nothing. It's like I could be from Argentina, Argentina you know, so it's complicated and people just lump us together. And it pits people against each other. That's the sad part. Um, one of the issues um, that, that, that Lily made me think about is this word diversity and how diversity has been used. And basically diversity has been used to gut affirmative action, to remove yourselves from the commitment of addressing people who have experienced racism here in this country for years. It has been used, it was, affirmative action was supposed to level the playing field. And, and what's happened is that you've got these people coming from all over the world with or without income, sometimes privilege, taking up the spaces that were originally created for those people who had historically been disadvantaged in this country. And so what you're seeing right now is that blacks and Puerto Ricans specifically in New York City are lagging behind every single racial and ethnic group, including new immigrants. That's, that's my, that, that, that blows my mind, you know? Uh, because all of a sudden, that door that they opened for everybody else, they, get left, they got left holding the door. So while we think diversity is a powerful and strong and necessary thing, and we love that, we want to lift that, we celebrate difference, we also think we need to pay attention and target those people who've been left out and, and level the playing field. So, um, so in our organization, we have a lot of love for everybody. There's a little bit of everybody. It's like Sanko right? <laughs> um, but we, we try to target communities that are left out. So when it was our LGBTQ youth, that were being attacked uh, in that community, we did an initiative around them. When it was our Arab youth after September 11, we did an initiative around them. Well, now it's our Puerto Rican youth, we have an initiative specifically to target our Puerto Rican youth. No, it's hard. No, it's hard for me to like talk about these issues, but I feel like I have to start talking about them with white people. Um, so that you understand that there's a lot of nuances even within our um, communities. And that it's not going to be like this, we're galloping and skipping down this path towards climate justice. It's going to be hard. And we have to be willing to, to, to talk about these things and be honest 
Um, and this is part of my self-transformation is being more open, you know, because before I'd be like, no, we don't got any problems. It's only white people that got the problems. You know, y'all deal with it over there. Um, but that, I realized, is um, a short-sighted vision for m me personally. I guess when, when, the, when you say white people, I'm just wondering how much of that is a class. There is some of it that is class, but... Right. Also, there white privilege exists. White no, no, I'm not arguing exists. any of that. You know, like when, you, when you use the race word, the race word is, is actually what I've learned is a better way to fight for justice in the United States. Class is a kind of taboo language. And when we start talking class, you get sort of shut down as you're creating class warfare and you're a Marxist and all this. You know what I mean? But when you look historically at class divisions, and where certain ethnic and racial groups fall within that, like, unfortunately, the majority of poor people are people of color because Wait, of exactly white what supremacy, that's exactly right? That's what we're saying. Yeah, we're saying the same thing. Okay. Here we are. So, Does anyone else have any questions or comments? And I also want to just chime in and say that I, um, I have a hard stop at 1.30. I explained to some of the folks who weren't here before. But if you wanted to stay on, then I'll just kind of slip out and let you guys moderate yourselves from here. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Great questions. Oh, thank you. Please. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you all. Uh, how, how, how can I get the notes? Notes, yes. I'm giving you oh, that list. We're going to pass yeah, the list. Yeah, the list. Didn't really happen. I'll get it. Okay, I'll great. pass this around, and then I'll um, send you a picture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You didn't get to tell us your story, Jackie. This is your story. I'll tell you the truth. Where do you live, Jackie? I live in Maryland, actually. Yeah. Mm. Just say a word about IMAC. IMAC? Uh, no, yes, no. I okay. think you could while I'm... Okay. Yeah. If you don't mind. Yeah. Don't leave it on the spot. <laughs> environmental justice organizers and coordinators to come into our neighborhoods and do what we're already doing. And so they've taken away resources from us uh, and they've created a situation that has created more tension. What we have historically done is we have reached out to those groups and said, this is what we need from you. Uh, we need this assistance. Um, so for example, I, I served on uh, Mayor Bloomberg's Sustainability Advisory Board. And on that board, uh, there was a, they were trying to push waste to energy. And I felt that waste to energy wasn't going to be in the interest of our community, but I didn't know enough about it. So I contacted an RDC and I said, listen, can you do a white paper? And I want to know how waste to energy works uh, all over the world, how it would work in New York, what it would mean for us. Can you, can you provide me with that? And they did. And I was able to use that to take the waste to energy off the chart. 
And so wait, so I contacted NRDC. I asked for something that our communities across the city needed. We didn't have the resources. We didn't have the technical expertise. And they were able to do that. That's really different from NRDC coming into our community and taking on that fight. When we were starting to work to defeat the siting of the power plant, NRDC came in and met with the power plant company and said, don't worry about uprolls, we'll handle them. And we found out about that. We threatened to protest in front of NRDC. We said, we'll do that. The news would love it. We will do that. Because you were supplanting local leadership. The power plant, the fight against the power plant was something that was started by our young people. They worked on that fight for three years. The fact that they were able to defeat the siding of a power plant was powerful and transformational. Why would you take that from them, right? So there is a way of doing it right, and then there's a way of not doing it. And we have managed to do that with a variety of environment. And we have had these sit-downs with them just this past year in Wisconsin, in California, in D.C. That's just this past year. These sit-downs sit on how to, how to do this in a way that makes sense. And in all of these organizations, there's folks like you that want to use those resources that that institution has and that expertise to advance the, 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 the agenda in a community. And you can. And the process really is what dictates that, how you do that. So we've had very successful relationships. NYPERG, for example, NYPERG helped us with Article 10, you know, legislation to basically that addresses the siting of power plants. Very <coughs> successful with them. So we had good and bad, um, but we're committed to making it work because it's in the interest of our communities. I actually am working um, for Greenpeace to do that. So when I moved to DC, um, the environmental justice partner, so the Energy Action Coalition puts on something called Power Shift, um, and they you know, have been tagged as the hub of the youth climate movement. Um, there are a small number of environmental justice organizations within Energy Action Coalition and then some youth arms of mainstream environmental organizations. You have the Sierra Student Coalition, you have the Greenpeace Student Network. Um, the Kurds were part of the coalition, but they would not sign on to the anti oppression principles, and so they I'm were. Sorry, they New, out. New York Kurds. Um, I know about the other Kurds. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like New York <laughs> Kurds has it, it better, um, you have a better sense of what their role is. Um, and so the Energy Action Coalition, um, they served as a regranter using like the access that NWF, the National Wildlife Federation, the Sierra Club has to these funders um, to bring in this pot of money and then regrant. And that sounds all lovely and beautiful, but what we saw is that even within that effort to like share resources, the bigger environmental groups were still getting more money. And so there was still that tension. And these are, you know, younger people that had good intention, but when the shit hits the fan, they're looking out for their homies. You know, they're looking out, well, Jenna, we don't want to fire Jenna. We'll give the Sierra Student Coalition more money. It's like, they're not producing as much. You know, we have somebody, Candy Mossett is an Indian country um, organizing, and she's going between South Dakota and North Dakota, but you're only giving her a third of what you're giving the Sierra Student Coalition? You know, like, get out of here. And so that was a big tension, and what I did before I left Energy Action Coalition was create um, a specific budget for environmental justice work. And so that was like, this is a commitment. At the very least, after you re-grant money to partners, there's going to be additional money for EJ-specific work, right? And now um, I'm at Greenpeace, and I'm helping them launch something called the Movement Support Hub, which is an interdepartmental team um, of staff that's working um, in two tiers. One is an internal tier to challenge and transform the organizational culture, and that does involve trainings for the current staff and then working with HR to physically transform the organization and bring in people. Um, but one thing is, when you're committed to social justice, it's not about diversity, because you can just pick up a black or brown person off the street, they have no framework or analysis, and they're 
probably just as bad as three white males, right? Because now you have a co-signer. You have, well, we have the black person or the brown person in the room. It's like, but if they're not committed to social justice, so that's not the framework that they operate from, it really doesn't help. And then there's the external tier, and that's actually my favorite part, and that's opening up the resources that Greenpeace has, whether it's um, research support, whether it's action support, um, communications, media support, whatever community groups need from us, that's what we're trying to offer, right? And really being careful about um, ensuring that we're not patronizing and we're like, hi, we, you know, I think we you can use some research support. You know, it's like, no, how do we also like empower folks um, to be able to do the research themselves, lean on Greenpeace for sure, um, and then also offering fiscal support, because that's really, if. and I tell this to environmental organizations all the time, if you're serious about working in solidarity with the and CJ communities, where is your commitment to putting down some dollars to that? Because it's not like you're gonna hire a diversity um, coordinator on staff and that's it, no. So what, we're doing is we're offering and our budget is small compared to the budget of the rest of the organization um, but it's fifty thousand dollars and so what we've been doing with that 50k is offering mini grants to organizations uh, or small environmental justice groups our priority is environmental justice and climate local groups um, so 60% of our time and resources are going to that 30% are going to um, networks of these small groups, so like the Climate Justice Alliance, um, the NIJA, the Summit, like things that are happening on a bigger scale, but that are driven by the um, EJ and CJ leadership. And then 10%, the remaining 10% is for broader movement-wide things. So like we realize that some of the things that are happening around PXL are still being led by 350, even though they've had to be checked and they've had to recognize the indigenous environmental networks um, role and now they're like, there's a time that at rallies, they were trying to pull indigenous people off of the stage because they were taking too much time at the rally. Mm -hmm. And so that, it, it sucks. It sucks to have to think that. It's like, wait, you've had five white males talk and these are the only indigenous voices from the front lines and you're, you're like trying to bring in the like, hook, oh, get out of here, you know? Um, but that's what we see. We see that a lot, right? And so to answer your question, you know, it is about what monetary commitment can your organization make? And making sure that there's no fire hoops that organizations have to jump through to get that money, no strings attached to get that money. It's just basically we are recognizing that as white-led organizations, foundations favor us. How do we use that privilege to um, close the resource equity gap. So I'm going to say that the money is really important, but it isn't just the money. Um, I'm just going to add, Uprose is the lead organizer for the New York City Climate Justice Youth Summit. And last year we had 750 young people of color come. And the reason we organized that was because we saw that all over the country there were young white folks that were studying climate change and that our young people weren't part of the leadership. And we needed to create a space where they would have an opportunity to do that. Um, EAC offered us funds to go to power shift. We felt that our community was the real power shift. And we felt that unless our young people um, were part of the decision making process, not just ours, but young people of color, that they weren't going to be coming in, scholarship in to be part of somebody else's agenda. Uh, we felt that we didn't want them to fight to be at the table because my generation had to do that. And because we're intergenerational, we felt, why should another generation have to do that? Why do they have to keep fighting to be at the table when they can actually just create their own? So, um, so we didn't send New York City to Power Shift because we created the New York City Climate Justice Youth Summit. And it was a way of saving, sending a message that things have changed. And so we need the resources, that's true, because we are under-resourced, that, that's no joke. But it's about how decisions are made, how much people are willing to give, how much power they're willing to give up and share, you know? Uh, because, because that's really what, what 
what environmental justice is about, people speaking for themselves. The first shot, Power Shift Conference, we sent a young person to, he contacted me, said there are workshops on environmental justice being led by white young people. Now, the young people in our community are organizing. There are trees all over the neighborhood before the one million tree thing that they, they made sure were there. They, they've changed the landscape of our community. Why can't they, why sh shouldn't they be leading these workshops? Um, isn't there something from them that white youth can learn? You know, we should be able to learn from each other. So for us, it's about power. It is, and, and the resources are really important. This resource came out of a conversation with the head of, um, of Greenpoint, and, uh, uh, Greenpoint a meet, um, Greenpeace, a meeting that we were at. Um, and he just really opened up his whole heart and really thought about Greenpeace having to move in a different direction. And so he basically set the tone for, for Greenpeace to start moving in a very different direction. And now Lily gets to be there and do this really cool stuff. And she's, she's, she's EJ straight up, right? So, but this, this guy was in a meeting and he was listening to all of us and he was like, that's what we gotta do. So it happens, but, but, but the longer it takes, the harder things are going to be. And, and because, because Sandy was just the other day, you know? So anyway, but, but um, resistance for us is resilience. And so we will resist any effort to try to define for us what the agenda is. We will resist that. And it doesn't matter it, it, if our people are not part of creating that agenda. We, we're just not going to, uh, like I said, be passive recipients. So. Yeah. Well, a uh, quick testimony on the question. I you know I, I went to an Uprose uh, youth event in, uh, I don't know, last summer or something. You look familiar. Uh, from a Brooklyn piece. Oh, yes. And, and um, I was just blown away by the, the numbers of young people, you know, come out to this event and who were knowledgeable on some level of, you know, about, about the issues. So my question then is, uh, you know, can you briefly say how it is that youth get attracted to Uprose or Uprose attracts youth to its work? So we love your organization, by the way. Uh, we do, we invite you to everything. I know who you are now. Um, how we do that um, is uh, we talk about power. We tell them that um, they need to feel like they're not being talked to, like they're not being controlled, that they're an integral part of decision making. When they see that their engagement results in something that is addictive. So, for example, the young people that first came to Uprose and stopped deciding in the power plant, they stopped deciding of a power plant the size of three football fields. What do you tell them after that? They have no power? They did that. You go to Sunset Park and you can cross the street now, 4th Avenue, because the median has been expanded. Our young people facilitated that process. They did that, right? Um, there's a waterfront park in Sunset Park that was going to be put in Bay Ridge. Nobody knows that Uprose put a young person in every circle and they said, move it to Sunset Park. Why are you giving Bay Ridge more open space, right? They did that. Um, and so if they feel like they are driving change, and they're learning how to testify at hearings. They're talking to the press right now. You know where they are right now? They were supposed to be here, to be passing out leaflets on the People's Climate March. And they found out that there is a Puerto Rican Day Parade in the Bronx. And so they all went. And I'm talking Dominicans, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, um, middle, all of them went over there to leaflet because they know that Mueve Day is going to be in the Bronx and Muevete has a conference, and they want to get the Muevete folks to come to the New York City Climate Justice Youth Summit. So I'm watching it on Facebook. I'm watching the feed. They're like, well, we got to go there. That's the more strategic place to be, right? So, so it's a youth word of mouth kind of. Uh... Yeah, but they, they are provided with training. They're provided with guidance. They're provided with opportunities to grow, to exercise leadership. Uh, we don't romanticize being a young person any more than we romanticize being a poor person because we were once young and we were once poor, right? So if they're not right, we tell them, listen, that's not, that's not the way to go about that. Think about this. The beauty of intergenerational relationships, there's a lot of things that are good about it. But one of the cool things is that 
because they have guidance and support from people who are older, they, they make progress a lot faster. They don't have to make the same mistakes we made. If every single, if young people, see this is a country where um, generations are pitted against each other. And so you've got young people saying it's youth led, right? And they have no rhythm for people who are older and older people wanting to hold on. And, and younger people discriminating against older people saying make up the space and move on, it's our turn. There's a lot of competition. But in our people, from our people, from our nations, from the places that we, we have parties where you've got somebody 80 dancing with somebody four years old. That's our culture. Intergenerationalism for us is a beautiful thing. And, and we honor our elders, right? So, so we've created a power structure at the organization that reflects that. And they love it. And you can talk to them. You know, you don't even need to talk to me. Just mm -hmm. talk to them directly. Why do they keep coming? They don't ever have to age out, right? Because <laughs> we're intergenerational. And so what happens is that you've got an older cadre of young people training the next coming up. So just recently, if, you, if you're on Facebook, you saw uh, Junior Justice. And you have the teenagers teaching the, the little kids how to plant cilantro, how to do all of that stuff. And then you've got the older ones that are in college organizing the summit. It frees me up to come here and talk to you. You know what I mean? It's all good. And, and they understand power. They understand that we say to them, even academically, their grades go up. We say, every time you, don't, you cut class, every time you don't take care of business, somebody in another neighborhood, who doesn't look like you is going to become your boss, going to determine where you live, how you live, and how much you get paid. Do you want to give that up? And they're like, oh, hell no, I'm like, that's what that's about. It's about power. So, I don't know what else to tell you, but I think you should talk to them. I think you should just ask them directly. Because right now, they have a thing now, it's divestment and, and zero waste. And yesterday, they spent the day learning about anaerobic digesters. How to build them. They want to know how to build them. Because we have a climate justice hub, which is a walk, a block by block organizing uh, effort to take part of Sunset Park off the grid. And so zero waste is, is a piece of that. So they went off to learn about anaerobic digesters. How old are they? 16, 17 years old. Do we cream? Do we take the student who's, do, who's an A student? Absolutely not. Are they an A student by the time they get out of uproads? Yes. Yes, they are. Do we tutor them? No. What they do is they reclaim their life in the future. Am I proud of that? <laughs> Hell yeah. We talk about it all the time. It's what gets me up in the morning. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, a couple of things. One, yeah. this summer I came down the Hudson River with the Haudenosaunee people, mm -hmm. and it was a very intergenerational experience, yes. very controversial. Two, there are other groups besides the ones we've been talking about, for example, as an artist. I know in the 60s when white industry moved out, all these artists moved in these great working spaces. Ten years later, at the Loft Living page, and Soho artists could, couldn't afford it. I moved to Tribeca. Same thing happened there. Got an inexpensive space. Everyone, oh, what a great deal this is. We'll do the Loft. So, I mean, there are other groups that are also facing these issues, not just class and race. You know, there are other groups that face some of these kinds of things. Uh, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about how you deal with corporate situations of greed. And the last thing is, you said when you look around the room and you find your own way, and I look around the room here, and that's the situation we're in. I mean, I walked into the place, I mean, this is my third year, last year I did a workshop myself. But like, why aren't we seeing even here more, you know? And like, what can I do as a person to really you touch upon that a little bit? To be to to the uh, multi problem that you're working on because I also am part of the planning group for this climate march and I really sincerely want to make it as big and as dynamic as possible and the climate is the issue that's drawing us together but at the same time we have to recognize each other's problems and work together so specifically how we can build more on that for this climate march. Can you ask me? Yeah, like you I mentioned I some things already, but why aren't more people in this room? Or why haven't they been? You know, why are we pretty big? So white? Is it people of, um, are there people of color on the planning committee for this? this is yes. Common. Yes. This is the first. I've been to like five environment, environmental camps. First one of the people of color. Yeah, actually. On the yeah. Uh, the, yeah it's, three it's, years it's, ago was my first. Work was my first one last year day workshop. I just came to it as the first time, but very few. I mean, I think that that, 
you know, as Elizabeth mentioned, it's about like having people of color in meaningful positions, right? Like where if I was part of a planning committee for this, I would obviously reach out to my people and say, come to this because I know it's going to be really dope because right. I've been on the planning committee, right? Like we help to pick the panels, we help to like set the agenda, we help to do all of this. So it's like if you're hosting a party, you're right. going to invite your people, right? right. Um, if you're not, if you're just on the guest list, you might tell a couple of people to come along, but I mean, that's one suggestion. Um, okay. if, People are serious about, you know, yeah. changing the face of it. Just very briefly, like, thank because you. Because I think of the social forum, yeah. and that is majority people of color, and we are having conversations about leftist theories. Um, but the planning committee for the U.S. Social Forum looks and talks and walks like us, you know. So it's easier. It feels more accessible. It feels like a space for us. I want to thank you. I really thank you for all these insights you've given, and uh, and and I I want to really work work on this issue. So I thank you very very much. Really, you've given me a lot. I'm happy to be here, and I I'm great. I'm so happy to see. You. Happy to see you. Because I see her in DC, so it's great when she's here. Really oh, Jackie. No, let's see Jackie. Oh, Lily. All the time. Lily. Lily. Okay. Well, she's in DC too, right? Yeah, she's in DC, but oh. she travels. She travels a lot. Yeah. yeah. I tell you, as a person, a person working within the Christian community, I have a lot of, I have a lot of resistance that I have to deal with. Hey, I, I, I was I the person who was facilitating clergy for for the movement, and I couldn't deal with the egos. There was all these men and all these egos, and I passed on the leadership to somebody else. I just literally <laughs> said, this is not a struggle I want to take on. I don't want to do this. This is really I toxic. Surprised. I can't do it. And I, you know, and it's it's working, but it was just like this, like, it was like, yeah, oh my God, I think I left out like a group. I was like, I said, the Lutherans, the Baptists, the, I went through the whole list and I think I left out like a group. Oh my God, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I said, listen, you like my, my, my father, my brother-in-law said to me once, said, do you believe in God? I said, yeah, I believe in all of them. I come, <laughs> I come from Yoruba traditions. To me, it's all good or it's no good. So I left myself out of it. It was just too much. Thank but, you very much.